Yeah, I'm going to be here too. It's a perfect little thing together. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to call the HR committee to order. You need to call your general counsel to order. Neil. Yes, ma'am. Are you ready? <laughs> I believe this is an indication to ready. Yes, ma'am. Okay, all right, thank you. All right. I'm sorry. Okay. Do we have any citizens wishing to address the. No, ma'am. Okay. Then the next item on our agenda is the uh, approval of the minutes. Are there any corrections to the minutes? There are no. Uh, Corrections to the uh, minutes, I will entertain a motion for approval. Motion for approval. Okay. Uh, motion by um, Mr. Powell, second by Steve Montgomery. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, okay. I want you to want y'all to note how smart your CFO is. Cookie lady. Just saying, she just brought <laughs> cookies from that room into this room. Don't ever question her intelligence. <laughs> All right, uh, then uh, the next on the agenda is uh, you, Neil. We have several policies, okay? And these are the annual, the three-year review. Uh, JCO requires uh, these be approved. Uh, there's not anything uh, that, that in any of these that uh, there was some edits, cleanup, but uh, those, were, those were posted on your web portal. Right. So, you have to take each one of those individually, unfortunately. Oh, okay. Our first uh, policy for approval is paid time off benefits, um, the PTO. Uh, are there any questions on that uh, policy? If there are no questions, then I'll entertain a motion for approval. Okay, approved by move, uh, Steve, second, second by Ramp. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. Our next policy is 1900 educational leave benefit. Are there any questions on that? There being no questions, can I get a motion for approval? Move for approval. Okay. Uh, Charlie, who seconded? Second. Okay, Ralph. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, then we have an education reimbursement. Did I have? Yeah. Are there any questions on the education reimbursement policy? Yeah, I, I have one. I think it's education reimbursement. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, in the block on the reimbursement, uh, you, you got back so much A, B, C, D. But in the A, B, C pass, but then D, F, there's no reimbursement, but D is passing. Pia, did you hear that question? <laughs> no, 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 I did not. I'm sorry. Won't you come up yeah. to this mic? I did not. I thought you didn't get credit. What was the question? I'm sorry. Reimbursement. I was eligible to run track. <laughs> We're not talking about track. <laughs> what is the question? <laughs> On the reimbursement, A, B, C, D, it had the increment. Reimbursement. You got an A, you got 100% reimbursement, and B. But then you got down at C, then it had below C, then it has pass. So, like, I guess the class is a pass or fail class. Mm -hmm. They have those okay. type of classes. Mm -hmm. Okay. But then below that, it said D or F, no reimbursement. Right. So, D is not passing? No, it's not. Not to get reimbursement. Oh, not to get reimbursement. Mm -mm. In the school, in the institution, it may be passing, right. but to get tuition reimbursement, no, it's not passing. Okay. Right. No employee. Okay. No one's going to make any D's amongst us. <laughs> <laughs> if you're in college making D's, that's a concern. Yeah. <laughs> Do not answer any part of that. Just let that go about what you did in college. I know, I have. Are there any other questions on reimbursement? All right. There being no further questions, can I get a motion for approval? So moved. All right. A raffle. Who <laughs> <laughs> seconded? Can I get a second? Steve? Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, the next is our demotion uh, policy statement. Are there any questions uh, concerning the uh, demotion policy statement? 
So moved. Okay, it's been moved by Ralph, second by Steve. Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Then we have a promotional uh, policy statement. Are there any questions on that one? Then I'll entertain a motion for approval. Ralph, approved. Uh, Charlie, second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And then jury, jury duty. duty and court appearance policy. No questions, motion for approval. Oh. Ralph, the doctor is there. Okay. All right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All right. Okay. Thank you. Then next we have uh, uh, Bill and Pia uh, on the annual incentive performance plan. Good afternoon. Hello. Uh, today we're bringing you the year-end performance for the fiscal year 17 incentive metrics that we established last fall, fall of 16. And I think they're on page 11 of uh, the board portal. I hope I've got the right page there. I'm in the hard copy book. We tried to make this as, as visually intuitive as possible so you can see red green and know what's in the money what's not in the money so to speak we had two quality incentives of reducing uh, cath catheter associated urinary tract infections and reducing falls with injury you can see on the far left column what the th fiscal year 16 result was and on the far right column that's populated anyway with the fiscal year 17 result was so we had a range of performance levels threshold target stretch and the green bar is intended to indicate where we fell in that range so we were a little bit shy of our target for caudi a little bit better than target for falls with injury we only had one and i think that's something that we as an organization need to celebrate, have celebrated. It's, it's really remarkable. We have a lot of falls, okay, and we need to reduce the number of falls we have. Falls with injury, pretty significant, and we've worked really, really hard to reduce that. The population health indicator was improved days to next third new available appointment for new patients. And we had three of 12 clinics that met that metric in fiscal year 16 we established a threshold of four we hit that threshold in fiscal year 17 so four of our 12 clinics are able to see pa new patients within less than 25 days perception of care these are all of our caps h caps ed caps cg caps and we did really well in 17 and 16 i'm sorry for h caps patient perception of care inpatient perception of care um, we knew that fiscal year 17 was going to be a challenge often we're told at least by uh, the survey team that we use in our c picker that we could anticipate some sort of a plateau maybe even some regression after having moved so far so quick so we achieved the 78th percentile, which we celebrated a lot in fiscal year 16. So in establishing our targets for fiscal year 17, we remained aggressive and we fell short. We hit the 72nd percentile uh, as of year end, December 1st. Five years ago, we would have celebrated vigorously the 72nd percentile but we're maintaining at least the level of performance that, that we have established. CG caps, um, this was an indicator that was kind of a hybrid, if you will. 50% was based on the overall rating of our primary care provider. 25% was based on our obstetrical pediatric provider. And 25% was based on specialty care provider. So our result in 16 was 32nd percentile. We regressed in fiscal year 17, dropping to the 28th percentile. And ED caps, in spite of the 
great work that our ED physician team is doing in communication, yet it's but one component of the ED CAP score. Uh, particular noteworthy, even though he's in the room, the physicians in the ED are doing a really good job at communication. We, we see that in our scores. However, the percent of time that the physicians actually spend with the patients in the ED is minimal in relation to everything else that occurs. When you think about all the testing that is occurring, the physicians aren't in the room. When the nurses are in there, the physicians aren't in the room. When uh, patient representatives are in there, physicians are not in the room. Sometimes we have to board patients on the wall while waiting for a bed. And physicians aren't tending for tending uh, to their care. So um, we were the 33rd percentile from an ED, overall ED perspective in 2016. We increased to the 34th percentile in uh, 2017. Based on those ranges, uh, every one of those performance uh, goals were out of the money, so to speak. And if you want to, Bill, you don't have to, because I don't want to complicate your presentation, but you can advance slides, or Pia, you can advance those, so you can, we can have on screen what you're mentioning. Do you want to try that? Mm -hmm. I, I guess, Bill, and even Nick, since you're here, thanks for being here. Um, I gotta, gotta believe that, that, that ED is a direct relationship to volume. In the ED. I mean, boarding obviously is a direct relationship with volume. We've gone from what we thought was crazy at 310 to now over 400 up to 450. So, you know, how do, how do we adjust metrics relative to volume variables that continue to just <coughs> drive the train? I can give a couple of quick facts. Is if you, if you look at the volume, if we have 54 physical beds and 20 hall beds, uh, the average ED of our caliber should see at most about four patients per bed for 24 hours. We're seeing 9.2. 9.2. Okay. Uh, we're on track with our, our bonds the other day to see 138,000 visits. If you can extrapolate and annualize that number, uh, there, we have made tremendous strides here uh, in partnership with our nursing and administrative leadership in things like the AHU, the admin hold unit, the ops unit. I mean, we are squeezing blood plasma bone out of this term up here. It is the most efficient PD that I've seen in Texas and possibly elsewhere. And, and so I don't want to discount the great work everyone does, but it is, it's busy. If anyone's never been down there, I'll be glad to take them down there and tour it. It's a little slow right now because of the weather, but about five o'clock tonight, it'll, it'll, it'll be a hop and hop and play. So not to, I mean, we still can take chance, you know, the, the opportunity to be, you know, polite and things such as that. But you know, our, our inpatient colleagues are working very, very hard. And when people are sick and they want to get into a hospital bed in a room, and we have to put them in a hall bed, it, yep. it, it, it doesn't help. Trent, right. to your point, yeah. if we were to put up a stat that showed, and we've done this in the past, to show your boarding increase and the amount of time that people board because we can't admit. Now, Sound Physicians has been helpful in the hospitalist program in readjusting discharge times. That's been helpful. The opportunity that we've had to take 60,000 plus folks and get them to urgent care has begun because your numbers would be much greater if we didn't have the urgent care facility. And to Bill's point, five years ago we didn't have that urgent care facility efficiency. But if we were to put those charts, you would see boarding increases and you'd see patient satisfaction decreases. Sure. To Nick's right. point, sure. when you're in your most vulnerable position and sometimes you're, you're, you're compromised and you're in a hallway and people are walking by, you're not going to say, I give this rating a 10. You're just not. Yep. And, and, and I'll say one last thing. So um, if you think about like right now we have 35 people waiting for a hospital bed and our peak hours in the emergency department start right about now. So we're, we, we have 20 beds. To, to see and use to see new patients, yeah. you know, pretty much the rest of the day. Everything else will be a hall bed. We're seeing people in bathrooms. We're seeing them literally, in, you know, in the waiting rooms. And we have, so we chase them down if they yeah. try to leave. I mean, we're pretty aggressive. But it's just, you know, it is what it is right now. We're, and I think we're doing a great job trying to keep up. Yeah. But it's getting busy. Okay. <clears throat> so.
So under stewardship, we had um, a rather aggressive goal, I think, on achieving 85% of our available district dollars. And as we'll talk about when we get to 18, you know, establishing performance levels is part art and part science. I mean, there's just no real definitive way to establish some of the goals. And I can say the same thing about employee engagement when we get there. Sometimes you just, it's just magic. <clears throat> it happens. And it's based on the leadership. It's based on the commitment of the staff. It's, ma it's based on the focus that they have during the year. I would say we're better than the state in terms of overall waiver projects of completion. We never anticipated 94.3%. We thought 88 was going to be lucky if we got it, but we did it. The team is to be commended for that. It's tremendous. Productivity is FTEs per adjusted uh, patient day. Our target was our budget, 5.96 per adjusted patient day. Uh, we were at six in 2016 and we ended the year at 5.9, which is um, commendable for our staff to manage the FTEs that they're responsible for. And employee engagement, um, I, I can't say enough about that. Our, our, our vendor is absolutely blown away. The work that this organization has done to move from where we were at the 24th percentile, four years ago, five years, five years ago, to the top decile, it's, it's beyond anyone's imagination. Couldn't even predict that would be a performance level that we would put in place for 2017. Before we got the scores, I told Pia that's where I wanted us to be in 2018. And lo and behold, the scores came back as the top decile for 2017. So overall, I think our performance was pretty good for the year along these metrics. Uh, caps, a little bit disappointing, but I think we have some plans in place for 2018. So this is the actual for 2017. Any questions, comments anyone has about that? I would say that, and you all remember this, um, when in the, the, the second year of this administration, when, when Karen Van Wagner sat right where you're sitting and saying, I want every <coughs> score in the 75th percentile, and I want it now, that was really, really challenging. And to, to Karen's vision and to, to Karen's spirit, we were able, not bragging rights, but we have a rule in our family that when you're just talking family, you can say these things. To be able to get so many of those in those upper percentiles, I think that Karen Van Wagner would say, um, you guys did it. And I'm proud to, in, in her spirit, to be able to say what we were able to accomplish in some of those categories. It's not all perfect, as Bill said. We have some real challenges, but I think more importantly, and this is not just all rhetoric, what I'm excited about for the organization is you've got a progressive forward-moving organization, not a backward-moving organization. We're not trying to pull anything up from the depths of trouble. We're trying to enhance where we're going, and we've seen improvement. I'm really proud of that team out there because they did that work. Okay. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if this is workable, um, but I've been in ED a lot, <clears throat> not me, Good. <laughs> but with patients. Uh, and one of the things that I've noticed, you know, when I heard Robert talk a moment ago about patient sat satisfaction, uh, because you go in ED, uh, it may not be space available, you know, and you have to put them on the wall to, till the room comes available. And, and a lot of times we expect the nurse or the, or the techs to comfort at the same time provide care. And, and I think that if there was some, maybe from the patient experience section that, that was a, a person who, who was there, maybe talking to the patients, going, well, listen, uh, I know we have you against in this bed, uh, with, you know, just helping them to understand why they're, they've been there for an hour or two hours because, you know, they're impatient and, 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 I, and I'm in a bad spot because I'm saying, Reverend Emerson, how come we can't wait, calm down? Calm. And so, because I, I know what that dilemma is, that struggle is, and I, and I think that maybe if we could look at somebody who was in ED who, who's walking and it's just kind of sharing info with that patient, 
you, uh, we, have, we, we still don't have a room available, but we haven't forgot you. Because when you're in there and it's helter skelter, a nurse will have time to just stop every moment and say, you know, uh, so I just thought I'd throw it out. Well, I, I can be corrected from the back of the room, but if I'm not mistaken, we have patient relations who routinely round every day in the ED. They can't be there all the time, every day, every hour, but I think that does occur. We could probably enhance that quite a bit, but it, it's a good yeah, we, when you're laying there and no one's communicating with yeah. you, you kind of think the worst. Yeah. Yeah. They forgot me, right? Right. right. Who else did they take ahead of me? Yeah. 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 We do, um, our patient relations team has done significantly <clears throat> different approaches to things. And what we do is we see 30 to 50 patients a day through our patient relations team that do round through there. Now, because we are so busy, that's still a, a, a challenge. Even if you're seeing 30 to 50, there's still a bunch that are not going to be seen at, at various times. But the patient relations team, and Anika's in the back, and, and Laura Burnside have taken that on as a major mission. So we're already going where you think we should we should be, and I'm, I'm proud of the team. They've done, they've done well with that. Because again, we found that patient sack goes up when you just communicate with them. Even when they know the circumstances, when they know it, where, you, where it doesn't happen is when, to Bill's point, you're just laying there and you're thinking the worst. They've forgotten me and I'm really mad or hurt. But we, we've changed some things. So we, we put on a teaching shift where this, this is one of our more seasoned physicians. They're not actively picking up patients. They'll be walking around to, to teach residents, right? And so maybe we put an enhanced rounding mechanism where they can just walk around and say, hey, it's a good point. Like we get to bed in like an hour or so. You know, I always walk around with pillows and things like that. You know, give you some water, a handkerchief, a cup, or you know, a blanket. So I think we just make people more aware. We'll come up with some ideas. Here, I'm going to throw this out to Nick. Yourself. Just put your, your, put your mic on. This came from years in the private office. Whenever we were running late, people were starting to back up. The thing that impressed them the most was when I would, or one of my colleagues at Surgeons, would go out and just announce to the people waiting in the waiting room, I'm sorry for the delays. We had some things we had to accomplish. Anybody that would like to stay, we will continue to see, though it's going to be a while. And those that would like to leave, please go ahead and do so, and we will schedule you first appointment the next time we're in the office. That went further to make people happy than anything. And you didn't have to necessarily make rounds to see everybody, but if you got a bunch of people on the wall, if you can talk to a group, I don't know, I'm just throwing stuff out. I don't want to see the nurses, the techs, and the physicians get deemed or have low satisfaction scores because we have to put people on the wall. I don't think that's fair. I, I really agree. don't. I agree. And, and the physicians will always get dinged for an unhappy patient, even though their outcome is perfect. If they're, if, as Laura would say, if their experience is a little bit poor, right. you, you suck. Yeah. I mean, there's one. The other thing that, that we have done to that, that point a little bit is um, Laura and the team have done discharge interviews. So inpatient clinics, OR, all get now patient relations that meet with them on discharge. So we get a clearer picture of what your program was from start to finish because when we intervene just at the ED level, which we are, you're only getting a slice. When you go from ED to inpatient, it's a specialty clinic. We're trying to get that whole continuum. Did we let you down somewhere? Did we help you somewhere? And that's been hugely helpful too. So discharge interviews have been really successful. Okay. Any other questions? I've got one more comment. Okay, go ahead. I hate to put my... No problem. But the change in the philosophy of the whole place I speak, I, this speaks to Robert and Bill and others that have put patients first. 
and the whole culture of the organization is reflected in what you folks have done. Thank you. Okay. And so I just throw that out there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this, this page is our proposed annual incentives. Uh, it's a dynamic document. It changes. Uh, we're recommending that we look closely at surgical site infections. We feel we have an opportunity from both a, an abdominal perspective, a, abdominal hysterectomy perspective, and a colon perspective. When you look at our numbers compared to others that we're comparing ourselves to, and look at the expected versus the observed, we've got opportunity. And you can see that actually in what we believe to be our fiscal year results for 17. They're not complete. There's a little bit of a lag, if you will. But we anticipate we'll have 11 colon surgical site infections in 2017. We anticipate we'll have 15 abdominal hysterectomy. <coughs> surgical site infections. We need to bring those numbers down. We need focus, organizational focus on those, and we're recommending those as metrics for 2018. The art, the science behind establishing performance levels, um, this was in consultation with our service line chiefs, Dr. Duane, Dr. Kelly Flood Schaefer, uh, along with nursing. <coughs> we're trying to establish some pattern of improvement would love to get to zero. There's no question. This is all about a journey to zero, but how practical is that? How soon? So we established a philosophy of whatever the end result is for 17, that minus one is our threshold. And you'll hear from Steve Sullivan, who is our consultant from Pearl Meyer later on. But Steve's cons uh, philosophy, I guess the company philosophy, and I happen to agree with it, Threshold ought to be something that you can hit 90% of the time, right? Target ought to be something you hit half the time. And stretch ought to be something you hit 10% of the time. That's kind of how we tried to structure these metrics. Um, and not without some pushing. So th this is what we're bringing forward with stretch at 50% improvement over fiscal year 17 actual. Um, we still need to focus on access, so we still want to recommend days to next third new available for new patients. Twelve is our universe. Twelve is our universe of primary care clinics. Uh, we really think that six is a reasonable threshold to shoot for. We're at four to date through 17, and 10 of our 12 clinics. We ought to be able to see patients within 25 days. We should. That's our target. That's our stretch. That's what we're shooting for, and that's what we're recommending. CAPS, um, it's a little different story. From an optics perspective, it doesn't look like there's a lot of segmentation between each of those uh, performance levels, 72, 75, 78. 72, as you might recall from the previous discussion, is where we ended up the year. HCAPS was the 72nd percentile. And these recommendations come to you not just from us, staff, they come to you from our vendor, NRC Picker. When you look at other organizations, and they have hundreds, hundreds of other organizations, the top 30%, top performers, top 30% performers in that database moves 0.4% in a year. The top 50% moves 1.4. Wow. And we're recommending these levels, which would make us if we were to achieve stretch, it put us at the 78th percentile at six points. Now, the top 10% move 3.7 points. We think we're a top 10, all right? That's what we put down here. CG caps, we're recommending a little bit of a change. We want to focus on the perception of care, the overall rating of the primary care physician only. Not the hybrid model, not with pediatrics, not with specialists but with primary care only. And it just so happens that when you look at how we did in 2017 from a primary care only perspective, it's identical to the hybrid. It's just circumstantial, it's serendipity, but it happens to be the same percentile. But we wanna focus on primary care in 2018. ED caps. 
a little bit different. If you look at the last page, you'll see that our actual performance from an ED CAPS perspective was the 34th percentile. But that's when we compare ourselves to other hospitals that aren't like us at all, that see a certain volume, I think, greater than 50,000 patients. Some are boutique, some are for profit, some are just very different. We'd like to consider a comparative group that's more like us, and you don't find many more like us. But what this comparative group is, is other level one trauma centers that see greater than 75,000 patients a year. And I understand there's 48 of those in the nation. So if you look at how we performed in fiscal year 17 against that group, we were at the 48th percentile. That's public, private, nonprofit. That's everybody that's level one over 75,000 in their compare group, in NRC Pickers compare group. And these right, are we could compare that and then put an additional filter over that relative to volume saying yeah we, not even you you don't well, see well, many even, even more of that is <laughs> volume for available beds right right it's right. almost right. like I mean I hear this and I agree with you yeah. it's one step closer yeah it's but it's additional just, filter really that would be more beneficial and, and frankly more truthful would be comparing us to what we actually have to compare ourselves to. Those well, other 10 or 15 hospitals yeah. in the nation that have volume equivalent? Absolutely. There's not that many. No, I don't there, There's not. Um, finance, Bill. I'm sorry. Uh, let me just say, I, I understand that <clears throat> when we talk about we want to just compare to us and others, but that's not what the real world is looking at. And so, I'm very, cons I, I just kind of want us to remember that I know we're busy and I know other hospitals are busy. I still believe that we have to remember that we're not the only hospital that have patients waiting to get a bed. So I think our numbers, we still have to look at those to make sure that when we say we are stretching, it is a stretch. And, and, and I will bring that up again and again because I think when we say that, that you need to put some extra effort. I believe we're improving, and I think you can see that, but I still believe on the stretch side, we really still need to continue to stretch. Okay? Now, you was on, level, on the trauma, so we're going to look at level one trauma centers. That's, that's what this number is going to be. Greater than 75,000. Right. Greater than yeah. 75,000. Under stewardship, uh, we're recommending that we no longer have the incentive around DISRIP. We don't know what <laughs> DISRIP is yet. We've, CMS has been talking about this for the last 18 months. We don't know. We, we anticipate that by August of next year we'll know. We hope. Um, it's always part of that uncertainty that that's the world that we live in. So we thought that a productivity measure and a net operating measure would suffice. Now, for us to hit the net operating measure, we're going to have to have efficiency around productivity, and we're going to have to have disrupt dollars. So it's kind of embedded, and that's why we're recommending a focus on productivity and operating margin. The productivity performance levels, 5.8 is our budget. That's our target. And the the threshold and the stretch is based on plus or minus 40 FTEs. So plus 40 is threshold, minus 40 from budget is stretch. Operating margin, 0.3% is how we ended up at 17. And we're recommending uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, and 1 for stretch in that particular goal. Human resources, um, like I said, top decile in 2017, that's it's kind of like someone said, it, it's, okay. it's analogous to losing weight. <laughs> the first 10 pounds, the first 50 pounds, it's all relative, right? Whatever you <laughs> need to lose. The first part's pretty easy. When you lose that part, it becomes more difficult. Each and every time you want to lose another pound. <clears throat> so we've, we've established recommended threshold of the 89th, 80, what is that? 86th percentile? That's close to where we are. And you can see the variance. You know, it's 0.03 difference 
between where we are this year and what the threshold is, is a difference of the 90th percentile and the 86th percentile. It's pretty small. Maintain is our target. Maintain the top decile performance in a stretch of the 92nd percentile. Another proposal that we would suggest your consideration and discussion around is the trigger. And the 2018 incentive metrics, we would ask your consideration of a break-even trigger, a break-even financial performance trigger. 17 is based on an operating margin of 1.5%, and that was our budget. In discussions with Mr. Sullivan from Pearl Meyer, um, I'm not going to speak for Steve, but I think I can paraphrase that had he been aware of that, he would not have recommended that as a trigger. That's not what this is about. Uh, given the financial uncertainties of this organization, which we have talked about, I don't want to say ad nauseum, but almost every meeting, we don't know what's going to happen from the state. We don't know what's going to happen from the feds. We don't know what's going to happen often from the county. We can establish a budget, and two weeks later, it's, it's a bust. So that's why we would like to put forward a proposal around a break-even financial performance, given the fact that our CFO will accrue whatever potential incentive is going to be paid out if we hit some of these performance levels. It would be accrued throughout the year and be a part of that break-even financial operation. So 2017, with a financial trigger of 1.5 operating margin, we didn't hit it. We hit 0.3. We did really well on our incentives, but we didn't hit the trigger. Um, Steve, did you have a question? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And I'm sorry, Bill. I want to, if I could take you back to ambulatory care for two seconds. Um, are you comfortable? Well, we've got some flexibility. If someone lives, um, you know, near Diamond Hill, that we can try to get them into Diamond Hill Clinic. Absolutely. And if we get them, if, if they can't get there, maybe we can refer them to another clinic that's in proximity. <clears throat> are you comfortable that there are enough guardrails that if someone lives in Azel, and we can't get them in Diamond Hill within the next 25 days, but we could get them in to stop six. I mean, is there guardrails to protect someone who can't get to Diamond or to uh, uh, I am, stop six? I am told we now have that mechanism. We didn't at one time. Okay. We, we now have the capability of looking network-wide at availability. And if somebody is there, we have other options for them okay. from their home clinic, aside from their home clinic. Okay. Okay, and I'm good with your trigger, by the way. So, Bill, I just one good question back to the trigger. Back to the trigger. The accrual that CFO Sharon would be accruing, it's netted out within the trigger. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. It's what now? It's within the trigger. No words to meet that right. number. Our goal, the trigger. There's no additional cost. Those expenses have already been calculated. In through the Sharon budget. can speak to that yes. better than I, but that's, that's the my way understanding. I understood it. Yeah. Thank you. Right. And she did the same thing for 2017. Right. Right? But yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, any other questions or comments about the uh, proposed metrics for 2018? The financial performance levels or any other performance levels? Okay. Uh, moving on to the long-term incentive plan that this board considered a couple of years ago, and Steve will talk more about that later on, but I want to update you on the performance of the two metrics that were selected in 2016. Just to kind of refresh your memory, this is a long-term plan that includes the average of the performance of the metrics over three years. And the first year of this long-term plan was in 2016. At the time, at the time, we thought these were the best metrics we could come up with that were meaningful to the organization and meaningful to the patients that we cared for. Reducing preventable harm. How can anyone be against that, right? Um, reducing ambulatory care sensitive 
condition admissions. That reflects how efficient, how capable our clinics are. Because if you're admitting somebody to the hospital for a condition that could have been treated in the clinic, right, doesn't make sense. So we selected these, and I don't regret selecting these at all or recommending that we select them uh, up front. Uh, reducing preventable harm the first year, and again, establishing those performance levels, we improved 33% over our historical performance in fiscal year 15. Couldn't have anticipated that we could have done that, but we did it, and based on the performance levels that were selected, we hit stretch on that particular goal. In reducing ambulatory care sensitive conditions, our baseline was 8% of those admitted to the hospital have an ambulatory condition that could have been treated in the clinic. We had 8.5%. We did worse. Didn't hit it at all. So that's 2016. That's, that's one year of a three-year type performance award, potential performance award. The next page is fiscal year 17. At the time, um, we did not understand that once you establish these goals and establish these performance levels, that they could change. So we did not change the goal. We did not change the levels of performance. So what you see in 17, you saw in 16. The same threshold, the same target, the same stretch. Uh, we did much better in ambulatory care sensitive conditions. We dropped from 8.5 in 2016 to 6.25. It so happened to exceed the stretch target. Reducing preventable harm, we had a little bit of a regression. We still reduced preventable harm from the 2015 baseline, but we weren't as good in 17 as we were in 16 from a composite perspective. But we didn't move the performance levels and we still exceeded stretch. Not sure that's a fair representation of really what we should have done. Now, there's no way we can go back and reconstruct what those performance levels should have been based on fiscal 16 performance. You can speculate, but no one knows for sure what that would be. So we would recommend that instead of a stretch performance level, that it be target performance level. So we have two years of a three-year performance plan that by and large we are stretch and zero, which is a average of 50% in one year, or 100% I guess, and then a target and a stretch in, seven, in 16, 17, I'm sorry. But all of this is averaged with whatever we do in 2018. Okay, 2018, we're recommending we change the metrics. And I, I, you probably don't remember this, but in January of this year, I brought forward that discussion about these metrics really aren't necessarily the metrics that we would like to focus on long term. Um, preventable harm is an admirable metric, no question about it, but there's one called leapfrog that you're kind of familiar with that's inclusive of 30 different metrics. It's clinical, it's stewardship, it's patient satisfaction. It's, it's a lot of everything that we're focusing on every single day. And it's a composite metric that everybody kind of understands what LeapFrog is. And you can compare yourself to others. And there's a numerical score which is equivalent to a letter grade. And when you see LeapFrog, you often see a letter grade. And we had a dip about a year ago that put us in a D category. That's not where we want to be. That's not who we are. And we want to focus. We want to focus on the journey to A. And we're making progress. But we want to put some focus on that progress that we're continuing to make. So we would suggest that LeapFrog replace the reduced preventable harm 
composite because it's a much broader measure of improvement. And you can see in the box uh, kind of how those performance levels were established uh, and what our threshold target and stretch recommendations would be for 2018 fiscal year. So Bill, how, when you make that big of a change in the metric in the third year or three year program, how do you go average out three years to find out if you made a strip made mark? They stand alone. They, they would stand alone on their, on their own. So you would average the performance, not the metric, but the performance okay. of the three years. Okay. So if a stretch and a zero got you to 100% and a okay. stretch and a target got you to 150%, then whatever you would do in the third year would be the third average, third year average. So the variable doesn't matter. It doesn't right. matter. It's Does. just it's measuring. It's Does. Just averaging the score. The, the long term, score. pardon? It'd be the rating score, not the math score. score. Yeah, the yeah, gotcha. yeah. In the long term plan itself, you need a measure that can't really be addressed in one year. It needs to be right. long term, and you don't want to change these all the time. Steve's, right. no. he, I, I hear him, I, I get it, but you want the right metrics. You want the right metrics, and I think, from a strategic perspective, this is the right metric. And the second metric we'd ask for your consideration is to focus on specialty care access. That has so many tangibles and intangibles to the future of this organization. It, it's a factor or a component of primary care access, primary care delivery, uh, scheduling, perception of care, getting patients into the specialists that need to see a specialist versus going back to the ED because they can't get in. And we've selected five specialties that really need our attention. And those specialties, as you can see in that top box, are GI, endocrinology, pulmonology, urology, and orthopedics. The longest um, time from referral date to appointment date currently is urology. And we've addressed that with our relationship with UT Southwestern, but it currently stands at 149 days. Not good. And I, we're, we're developing that baseline today, and that's, not, that's why I'm not bringing it forward as a specific recommendation. But I think it's important enough for us to spend some time and really understand the days that are at play here from referral to appointment that we could begin to focus on over time. And in January, with your concurrence, we'd bring back very specific recommendations around what that would look like for these five specialties. Now, I spoke with Dorothy about this earlier in the week, and she made an excellent point in regard to how satisfied the patients are when they get their appointment. We could get them in tomorrow, but if we don't do anything for them, and if we don't meet their expectations, I'm not sure it's accomplished just a great deal. So we're suggesting that we consider a modifier, a patient perception of care modifier for these five disciplines that unless we hit a certain level of patient perception of care performance, then this particular indicator wouldn't pay out at 100%. Maybe the modifier <coughs> is X, and if we don't hit X, this is only worth 50% of otherwise what it would be. If we hit Y, maybe it's worth 50% more than it otherwise would be. But it gives you that perspective, I believe, of how patients feel and how patients are accessing these disciplines. So that would be our recommendation, and I'd love to entertain questions or hear comments about that proposal going forward. This too, this too, had been suggested to be a break-even trigger. Yeah. Uh, Trent, did you have a question? Yes, ma'am. So, you know, having spent time on a different hospital board, um, I have some negative perceptions about leapfrogging, yeah. honestly. Yes, sir. We've talked about that. Uh, because leapfrog is so broad, and it, it, you know, you get a C in leapfrog, 
and it looks average at best. Mm -hmm. Whereas a C, if you measure it empirically against other standards, may not be bad at all. And so when you're, a, when you're an organization that tends to lean toward the acuity levels that we have and certainly the volume levels that we have, and given the facility challenges that we have, I'm curious if LeapFrog doesn't punish us from the get-go and never really reach where we'd like to be, using that as a metric. Trent, it, it's, it's a possibility, certainly, but I'm coming to you today with observed improvement in our score each and every reporting period. We're literally that close to a B. But, but literally. That's an impressive. Trent, don't they also, when they do leapfrog, they do take in the acuity of the patient, too. They, they factor that in. Um, now, that's my understanding of, of when they're doing leapfrog, that's a part of it. And I'll just say this on leapfrog. That's how the world look at us. If, when, when you go out there now, you can pull up and see our grade, and we can compare where we are with others. So I was sort of impressed that we were looking at putting that down as a, as a um, score because that is how other folks are looking at us. And it's, a, it's complicated, but I thought that when we looked at it, they take in the acuity of your patients uh, also. That, that is a factor of that. They don't take volume in, though. They don't take volume, but quali quality and harm factors are major components. And let me tell you my metamorphosis on leapfrog. When I first came as the CEO, I had quality offers tell me that leapfrog is, we don't need to address leapfrog. We don't agree with how they calculate things. And they would publish it, and JPS would be a D, or it would be a challenge. And so it was negating all of the good we were doing. So to your point, I, I, I agree with what you said. I'm not trying to be wishy-washy. I agree with you what you said, but I do think there's a perception and an understanding of LeapFrog, and LeapFrog has improved from its days of old, and I think it has advanced itself. But I do think it is a large public perception of what this institution is. And I feel pretty strong, uh, in addition to don't taking in volume numbers, I still think we can hit marks. And I think that if we focus on leapfrog and all the other stuff we're doing, because I don't want to be a, a totally leapfrog-centric organization because we'll miss out on some things, but I do think we'll get to where we need to go, even against some of the odds. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying leapfrog is not a valuable metric. Mm -hmm. Sure. I'm saying the application of leapfrog into such an important component right. relative to our long-term incentive plan is a big risk. Right. Okay. And, and uh, you know, th this is not just how people look at us. Right. This is a lot more than that. I know. This is, this is how our people are going to be paid and rewarded for the jobs that they've done. And the broader the metric, the more exposure you create when it comes to having injustice relative to that application. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just, I don't disagree with using it. I'm still not a huge fan of it because honestly, somebody picks up the paper and sees JPS and they see a D, we're bad right. all over. Right. Right. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what clinic I go to. It doesn't matter how, long, how fast I got through ED. We're bad. We fail. And, and I don't like that perception. But e even more dissonant is the notion that now I'm going to apply that to our employees. And the entire organization now is going to re be rewarded based on that incredibly broad mm -hmm. and generic application. I'm not discounting the value. I'm only, I'm only questioning the application of it in the incentive plan. And I'm... Okay. That's all well, I'll say about it. Maybe it, would, maybe it would help if we look at some of those things. So I know we talk about volume, but they also are looking at the quality of care that's being delivered within that institution and, and how you are, are measured on those and, and looking at other areas. It, it's, it's not just one measurement. It's a lot of measurements. It really is. It's... They, they, they look at more than sure. just, uh, just oh, that. I, and, I, I and, got it. I, yeah. I, I agree with you. Yeah. I'd never go along with it if this were the only one. <laughs> but I understand we can dilute it, but I think that's what we'll be doing, is diluting it with our other scores. But, but had our efforts to date not resulted in improved scores 
we probably wouldn't be talking about this. I agree. We can we can do it. I salute the, and I salute it, the optimism. It, it requires a focus day in and day out, but they're moving in the right direction. Yeah, I, I completely. And it's more reflective of who we are. Sure. I, right? I guess, Fred, my comment would be, and I respectfully agree with you. I do not want to do anything to penalize the movement we have seen yeah. in these metrics right. and what we've done. And you started this back in '13 because I still have. I was going to mention this. I still have the laminated copy of our destination metrics that we started in 13. We've come one hell of a long way. Well, yeah, we have. And I will say it that way, and I we commend have. this organization leadership. So, Trent, I agree with you. I don't want to see a metrics by which one item penalizes recognition and rewarding for work well done. At the same time, Dorothy, I think, I hear Bill saying, he's sitting there as senior manager of the organization, and Robert's sitting there, you're willing to put you and your team under that metrics. Make no mistake, because it's difficult. It's hard. It's hard, and I, and I appreciate that. That's what I'm saying. It's hard. And like you say, we may have been a D, and that's unfair because that letter gets out there, and I agree with everyone. All of a sudden, we become that. Yep. We are not that one letter. That's an assessment. Right. But I, Trent, I agree with you, and I, Bill. I respect the fact that y'all are willing to make that part of your metrics. So, again, North, I know the committee's done a lot of work and I'll, I'll get the floor back there. But well, I, 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 I agree with you, Trent. It I, makes me nervous. Yeah. I think what you're hearing today <clears throat> is a discussion of it. We'll get some more information and then you can make a final decision. I, I, I commend staff for how they look at that because when I look at LeapFrog, it's more than a score. It's looking at some quality of care issues and how, we, how we're doing in several areas. And if you don't move it, Sometimes we pick one thing and we do very well in it, but then there are other five or six others that we're falling down in. And so you still don't move forward. We do in that one area. Over in LeapFrog, we're going to have to make strides in several to move forward. We can't sit back. Yeah, it's a serious deal, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a worthwhile uh, issue because it takes in more than just numbers, and it takes in the quality of care that we are we are given. And I'll just end by saying this, that and Dorothy, again, on the HR Committee has done a tremendous amount of work, and Steve, you've attended meetings, there's been a lot of meetings, and I appreciate that. I want to be perfectly clear, I'm not afraid of any organization, let's leave for or anyone else coming in here and checking out the quality of this institution. So we're not playing games here, but let's find one that we, we agree with it, we don't agree with it. Right. I commend what you've done, Bill, and I commend the leadership, Robert, the entire organization, because we've come a long way, Trent, when we yeah. talked about these in 2013. And so, again, I don't want to sound like we're saying, well, let's find the one that we can pay and not assess it properly. That's not what's going on here. No. I think and I, I commend staff for saying, you know what, we're willing to go under whatever organization that comes in here and assesses the quality of the way we take care of our patients. So, Dorothy, I would say okay. let uh, HR continue to come back with a recommendation and, and all right. be fine. I have one question on the specialty care. As you know, I've always asked about specialty. Will they be lumped together or will GI stand alone? Each will, monitor each will each stand one? alone okay. in, as Very a relative good. measure, but there will be an overall mm -hmm. average based on the relative performance of each. So they won't get blended. And okay. I don't know the math behind that, but right. I'm confident we can do it because that was my question. Yeah. If you use an average, just a no. singular It'll average, help. your orthopedics at 56, is gonna pull you know, it, up. Is, mm -hmm. it might move a little bit, but your GI needs to move more because you're 120 right. days. As so long as we they stand all need alone. to stand on their own. Okay. okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And, and what I would like to do is, um, oh, no, I'll go on through with my agenda. Okay. okay. And then I'll come back uh, to that. You will, but we're going to do it after closed session. we got some other issues in closed session. Okay. Um, Pia. Yes. You are up for your HR indicators. On page 20. <clears throat> okay, so what I would like to do is provide you with a update on the uh, Human Resources Dashboard. 
uh, for the year of FY17, we have brought this dashboard uh, to the Human Resources <coughs> Committee uh, to provide you with an overview um, of our metrics uh, for the year. Um, as you look at the very top here of the dashboard, what you see is um, the quarter basis and then at the very bottom, uh, the data there supports year-to-date information. Uh, the measurement period for the dashboard is October 1st, 2016 to 930 uh, 2017. So the metrics that we do like to uh, focus on uh, for the year, I uh, wanted to give you um, an update on where we were with our vacancies. Uh, we closed the year in 2016 at 474. Uh, for the quarter, uh, we ended at 287. So we did keep our vacancies uh, down for the year in FY17. Um, and overall, just to give you a number of how many hires we made in FY17, we did about uh, 1,516 uh, hirings uh, for the year. So we did very well uh, with that for FY17. Um, another metric that we do like to focus on too as well is total uh, voluntary turnover. Uh, for FY16, we closed the year at 12.48. Uh, for FY17, the close for the quarter was 15.2. And when you go down to the very bottom looking at voluntary turnover, um, you see that we did measure that at 12.66 um, as well. Uh, the next metric that we do like to look at and, and we measure and we keep it on our radar uh, to focus on the turnover is that one year voluntary turnover. Uh, we ended FY16 um, at 18.02. Uh, the close for fiscal year 17 was 32.13, and that is higher than what we expected uh, for the year. Um, as you can see with the Saratoga data, uh, they look at keeping that metric at 16.3. With that being high, one of the key indicators that we did look at for the close for um, FY17 uh, was that we did have a lot of individuals that did resign for other positions. Uh, one of those indicators were two as well as that they probably wanted to take a lesser job to be able to go back to school or they did want to be able to uh, make more money in salary. Uh, one of the questions that did come up in our previous um, HR committee was how many of our team members uh, leave the organization due to salary. Uh, we did go back and run that data and it's a very small number. Uh, we were looking at about 5% of those that turn over. So, it's, it's not the, the compensation overall that they look at, it's the entire experience um, as well. Um, again, one other key metric is the 90-day turnover. Uh, for FY16, we looked at 4.7. Uh, we ended um, FY17 the quarter with 6.93. Uh, benchmarking against Saratoga, we were lower than that. So that means that we're getting better with that 90-day turnover. Uh, that's a good time for the um, employee to ensure that this is going to be a good fit for JPS and also for our leadership to make sure that the employee is going to be a good fit for the organization as well. Um, so just wanted to provide an update to you to let you know where we are with our, our metrics. Uh, turnover is truly a, a key indicator. Uh, we keep our eyes on that because we do want to make sure that we're, we're keeping that, that number um, at the norm, which we benchmark against Saratoga data. Um, I always say this to individuals now because we have our bragging rights uh, to do this. Uh, with us being DFW top 100 workplaces, uh, modern healthcare, and then being at the ninth percentile, we don't want to get comfortable. We still want to keep measuring uh, that metric to make sure that we're keeping an eye to watch why team members are leaving our organization. So. For one of our goals for FY18 is to continue to measure that turnover, uh, put in place uh, reasons for the one year and the 90 day um, employees looking at why they're leaving. We're gonna focus on putting in focus groups to hear from those team members and what can we do better uh, to lower those numbers. Um, are there any questions relating to the dashboard? If y'all have any questions as to why she's your HR vice president, the way she wove that in there <laughs> is the perfect reason why she's your HR VP. Thank you, Robert. Okay. Okay. All right. Why is the turnover in IT so high? IT. So low. 
No, it, you have it for the less than 90 days. It's 10%. But the so when you look at the information technology, you look at your actives, which is 151, and then you go to the voluntary turnover, it's 3.30. And that's very low. That's voluntary. Okay. You have to look at that line. Okay. And then their total turnover is 5.28. Gotcha. Yes. So they, they're right where they need to be. And then when you look at their voluntary turnover for the year, it's 19.05, but still average on, they're still lower than what we need to be. So information technology is right where they need okay. to be. Yes, sir. Read the table. <laughs> it's a lot of data on the table. Those IT people, they just can't go. <laughs> Somebody's okay. always doing good. Any other questions on that? Okay. Okay. So let's go to our next topic, which is um, our engagement um, data. Uh, before we jump into uh, the presentation, just want to give you how we uh, did the employee engagement survey. Um, our survey was from September uh, 12 to September 26. We had 5,489 responses, which equal to 92% participation for the organization. So that, that truly has been the highest that we have reached uh, for our organization, and we did very well. So. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I, I, right, and we probably would have threatened it, probably be a little bit different. Yeah. You get a visit from the chief of staff. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's, let's look at the uh, Press Ganey employee voice model. Um, of course, for us each year, we have our uh, engagement survey branded with Share Your Voice because truly the reason why we put the engagement uh, survey in place with support from our, our CEO and our COO is to ensure that our employee voices are heard. Um, it, it truly assists us in, in making change to the organization. We want to focus on the culture and continue to make JPS a best place to work. When you look at the uh, domain here, uh, we have it set up by the organizational domain, the manager domain, and the employee domain. Uh, many times when we're out in the organization and we're rolling this out to the departments, the questions are, you know, what, what makes up these? What, what are the things that fall under each domain? So when you look at the organizational domain, some of the questions that fall there could be questions relating to their benefits. Um, it could be, you know, does JPS value individu individuals from different backgrounds and cultures? So those are some of the questions that fall under that organi organizational domain. When you look at the manager, manager domain, some of the questions that fall there is, does my manager treat me with respect? Uh, does my manager listen to me and value me as an employee? And do they involve me in decisions that affect my work? That is really one key question that for our team members, when they think about that manager, are they part of the, the decision making and the work that they have to do day to day? And when we look at that employee domain, the employee domain consists of, do I enjoy working with my team? Do I enjoy working with other departments in the organization? So our, our engagement survey is about 55 questions, and it makes up all these categories here to have a high engaged workforce. And so that's why when we, we take the employee engagement uh, survey very seriously, uh, just to ensure that for us as a culture that we're shifting and that we're transforming to make us continue to be a best place to work. So where are we today? So for myself, you know, when I identify where we were today and we received the, fake, the, the feedback, and as Bill discussed earlier, top decile was a goal that we wanted to reach in 2018. So what does top decile mean? Top decile means that out of all the 2,000 other organizations that sit in the Press Ganey database, we score top decile over those organizations. That's what that means. That 4.36 means that for us, we scored at the 90th percentile um, as an organization, which is truly remarkable uh, for JPS. This is great. This is outstanding. 
And when we get further into the presentation, where you look at where we started when we started with the Press Ganey survey, we were at the 24th percentile in engagement, and today we're at the 90th percentile. So hats off to our leadership team, to our employees, uh, to everyone for making this happen for the organization because this is truly remarkable. Um, when you look at our tier distribution, uh, for us we had 68 uh, percent tier one distribution. Uh, we had 26 percent tier one distribution, and then tier three we had six percent distribution. He had, do me a favor mm -hmm. and help board members and those okay. listening in live streaming to know the difference between a tier one department and a tier three department because we talk it so much I think we take it casually. Yes. So why don't you describe a little bit about what is a typical tier one department and Definitely. what's a typical tier three. Yes. Tier three so, you've got a D. <laughs> Depending on what school you went to, you could still run track or not run track. <laughs> it depends on how fast you're in. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so when you look at a tier one uh, department, usually those are your departments where um, you have very low turnover, uh, very, uh, very few counselings. And when I say counselings, I mean like your written, your finals, those type of things. Um, you have a leader that has great communication, they know how to follow up, follow through, and the team members are following. They follow that leader. Um, so when you look at that tier one group, usually that's the environment that you walk into and the type of culture uh, that you have with that team. Tier two, somewhat similar, but there may be some things that you need to work on. And when we talk about that, things that you may need to work on, it could be anything relating to um, the employees wanting more recognition, uh, the employees probably wanting more one-on-one -on -one time with their leader, um, and you may have those employees in the department that truly want to feel a connection more to the organization, getting a clear understanding of their purpose here. For your tier three groups, those are your teams where uh, they have very high turnover, uh, they have individuals who are not connected to the mission and vision of the organization. Uh, for them, um, it could be a, a magnitude of both the leader and the employees, both where there's not a connection. So when you see a tier three group, it's not all leadership. It could be issues with the team. And that's where, for us as an organization, human resources and our OD and learning team, we go in and work with those groups very closely. Uh, to do start, stop, and continue uh, methods with them to find out truly what is the core matter, why, what is happening here. So when we talk about the recognition around your, your tier one to your tier three, that's very important because now as a culture, this is our fear for your doing the engagement survey, departments have their bragging rights when they say that they're a tier one because everything is going well. And with the tier two, I mean, they're happy and they're great. And, and tier two is not bad. It's, it's really good. And tier three is we, we have concerns. There are things we need to work on. Again, that is OK. How do we move you from that distribution to a tier two or tier one? So that is really what we mean when we talk about the tier one, two, and three. Let me ask the question then. Um, the tier one, two, and three, is that for the administrative team to know that, or is that across the hospital? In other words, I know who's in a tier three versus somebody know who's in a tier one. So each department knows what their, their ranking is. So do I know what the other, who's in a tier one, who's in a tier two? <laughs> no, they don't. We keep it confidential. now. Our leadership team knows who. Yeah, that's not the Yeah, our lead, but for the employees, they don't. Okay. Unless they talk amongst each other to say, hey, yeah, they know. we're tier three. <laughs> now they talk to one another, and we cannot stop them from doing that, but we do tier not. Tier ones tend to talk more than tier three. <laughs> yeah, we don't go out and say that, oh, you're a tier three, because it's also a pride thing. Yeah, that's what yeah. And asking, what occurs yeah. with that, if a department is a tier three, we do not go out and say who is a tier three because our goal is to keep it confidential. 
let them know this is okay, and how do we work to improve? But what we do, that. though, that is a real positive in HR that I like a lot is we take our tier, and why you've seen such movement in, in the 2013 to 2017 change is we take our tier threes and pair them with a team one mm-hmm. department. And we take the leaders and we take the actual employees and sit them down. We'll take a leader from a tier one and, and embed them for a period of time in a tier three and say, here's some of the things that we do. Here's what we do to help people in challenges. Here's what we do for reward and recognition. So it's, it's not a published report, but it, we try to take tier threes and constantly help them get up. And it, it is helpful. Well, since our board is a tier one. Uh, <laughs> Now, how do you compare the yeah, other did, you, did you all take the survey as well? I didn't. We didn't get a report for you all. I think back to your original question, right? Does everybody know what they are? I think the answer is kind of, yeah. So, as a department, they know their they ranking. Know as a department, but for each department, we do not put out and publicize what each division is. We do not do that okay. to protect their confidentiality okay. as well. Yeah, yeah, you can just kill somebody's morale. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's why we work with them one on one to help improve. Can we, so, fi- can we find out what the C suite is? is it a- <laughs> uh, we, uh, we were tier one. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, we were tier one. Yes, we were. <laughs> I was going to stick to it. <laughs> Same story you're sticking to with the board. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, so <laughs> the next slide uh, provides you with an overview of the uh, tier distribution. Um, as you can see, we started the journey in doing our employee engagement survey um, in 2013. And when you look at this, this page here, it truly shows you the significant change that we have made as an organization. Back in 2013, when we did the survey, at that time, we had 37% Uh, tier three departments. Today we only have six percent tier three departments as an organization. So this here tells the story of how uh, we have changed our culture, how we have shifted forward, and how we want to continue to maintain our engagement scores and what our tier distribution is for the organization. Great. Congratulations. So next is trending data. Uh, The trending data uh, here provides you with an overview to show you what our percentile ranking, um, also our response rate, our readiness score, and our engagement trending score. Uh, When you look at the percentile ranking, um, as stated earlier, when we began this journey back in 2013, uh, we began this journey at the 24th percentile. And now today, we're at the 90th percentile. Uh, with our response rate, um, back in 13, we started at 86.4, and uh, this year we reached a 92% uh, percent, uh, participation, which has been the highest for us as an organization. With um, industry standards, um, also too, uh, with uh, SHRM, which is our Society for Human Resources Professionals, um, this truly, when you see that high participation, usually you have that high um, engaged workforce. Uh, With the regulatory, I mean regulatory readiness, with the readiness score trending here, uh, we we started at the 82nd and we are 87th with the readiness score. And what the readiness score tells us is basically as an organization, our employees want to continue to work with us, Mm -hmm. uh, to action plan, uh, to provide feedback, because they see that with the feedback that we're making improvements. So we do have a high um, action readiness score. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And they know that it's taken very seriously. And with the engagement trending score, as you can see, we have shifted forward where the rest of the industry is staying downward. They have stayed steady uh, with the actual engagement trending score. Are there any questions? Okay. So I'll move on to the next slide, which which is our engagement score results. Um, As you can see, these are our key questions that make up Uh, that 90th percentile. When we score high with our EI questions, which is our engagement indicator uh, questions, we're going to do well. And for each of these, what you can see um, is truly that we have improved. 
Uh, one of the biggest ones that um, I truly keep my eyes on when we get the engagement survey each year. Overall, I am a satisfied employee. Back in 2013, when the survey was taken, we scored at 3.93. Today, we are at 4.27. And remember, this is on a scale of one to five. So truly for us, looking at that question, we have shifted upward and we're, we're continuing to maintain and increase that score uh, about the satisfaction of our employees. We won't, we won't go through each one of these, but I did want to make note to y'all is, is we get comments from y'all and other people in the community. Well, I would just wish you could tell JPS a story. I just wish you could tell, you know, we ought to just tell people. We ought to put something in everybody's mailbox or whatever. Historically, we didn't even do a good job of telling JPS employees what they were. And when you go on that question, I'm proud to tell people I work at JPS, that hasn't historically always been the case. And you know that perfectly well. I'm really proud of that one because that was a lot of effort by our HR department and our communications department and others to say, one, let me tell you what you got here, but two, restoring pride. Because when you had that disastrous time, when you had so many tough stories and so many tough things going on, that means a lot. And when you combine that with best places to work nationally and best places to work locally, you all of a sudden get different recruits coming in and different people coming in when you have that level of pride. So I'm real proud of HR and I'm real proud of communications and I'm real proud of what we've been able to do because just communicating with 6,500 folks we found to be problematic at best. So, and that makes a big deal communicating out in the, in the public. So next, um, of course, we did score the 90th percentile, but these were uh, truly some of our strengths and I wanted to uh, share these with you. And when you look to the very right of you, when you look at the national healthcare average, uh, we retain these in being very high. Uh, and these related to the organization and employee domains. So for us, is that one key question that we like to uh, zone into is I feel like I belong at JPS Health Network. And that's important because for our employees, for them to be here each and every day, they need to have a connection to what the mission and vision is of JPS. Just like I communicate to um, our human resources team is that indirectly, we don't, we don't give patient care directly every day, but we give it indirectly. And what does that mean for us? It means that for us, when we have a nurse that is at the bedside, we need to make sure that for that nurse, she is not worried about her benefits, that that leader has all the tools necessary to do their job. If she has any questions relating to her retirement, we need to be right there to serve to make sure that they have a clear understanding of what those benefits are for them. So we do give the patient care. We just do it in an indirect way. So everyone truly has to have a, a connection on what they do in the organization. And it takes the leaders and the departments communicating that day to day on what their connection is to that patient care. Are there any questions relating to this thought? Yes, Dean. Yeah. Uh, National healthcare average plus 0.36. That's our, that's us over the average or the average over us? No. That's us over the average. So the average score for healthcare would be 3.94 for the first one. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. Any other questions? Well, I don't know, of course, it's just maybe a comment that <clears throat> when you look at all of this unemployment, employee engagement, and how high high scores are, <clears throat> then you go back and look at the presentation that Bill makes, they got to go hand in hand. Right. Uh, and that, that makes his job a lot easier of reaching those goals in the stretch, because if I'm happy, that means I, I enjoy working and I'll go for it. Uh, I think that's a plus. I agree. Yeah. Okay. okay, and opportunities for improvement second year in a row there are not any opportunities for improvement for us as an organization so congratulations to jpsf network uh, for their engagement and meeting the 90th percentile for engagement you. you don't have any problem <laughs> patting myself on the back <laughs> <laughs> all right all right there's, there's a great trend over the last what seven uh four or five years um i've noticed since 2015 it's like Really, yes. someone poured gas on it, and it's interesting. I, I came back on the board in 2015. Wait, I knew that was coming. 
I'm just saying. I'm not saying there's a causation or a correlation, but it's a little bit more than a coincidence. Yeah, I was surprised in the financial report we got earlier when we're doing better financially that you didn't take credit for that too. A lot of that came on when you came back to the board. I just kept it to myself. It was just a realization of all those chairmen like Trent and Ralph who came after him. All the hard work they implemented is just now paying off. If he wants to take credit, I'm not taking that Okay. We just left that slide off. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, okay. great job. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and this concludes my presentation. All right. Okay. All right. There being no first courses of her, what I'd like to do is uh, reconvene for executive session. At you can, oh, you have course. I'm sorry. I don't know, of course I have a comment. Okay. okay. I, I, I talked to him. Uh, this is maybe a suggestion. Okay. And if I'm out of order, I, I accept that. Um, where I sit as a board member and my relationship in the community, um, you, can, you have to keep in mind, I get a lot of calls or visits. Uh, and I was going, I'm asking if there's a way when there is operational changes or redoing movement, is that there, there could be somewhere uh, from HR or Robert, uh, a notice would go out to say, hey, uh, we're reorganizing population health. We're reorganizing a claim. We're, because it's that push then trying to push the board members over into personnel, uh, you know, just to respond. Hey, you know, they're changing our positions here. And I thought about that when, when, when uh, we looked at the policy about demotions and, and all that. So you know, it would just be helpful just if we got to. Uh, information note that just want to know we'll read. Yeah, doing. good point. Okay. Thank you. Could you take that on that? That would be part of the update that you was going yes. to send out yeah. to us. You okay. know, something. Yeah, just. yeah. Robert, well, that was part of Robert's improvement plan. He was going to send out a little update to the board. Mm -hmm. Didn't have to be anything fancy. But yeah. yeah, that would take care of that. Okay. Is there anything else? Anybody have? Okay. All right, I'd like to reconvene an executive session in about five minutes, okay? All right. Yes. We're ready to reconvene an open session. Oh, we didn't open the door. To, uh, we have one other item we need to do now that we've recon reconvened an open session uh, concerning the annual incentive performance plan. So I would make a recommendation, Madam Chair, that we uh, recommend to the board the acceptance of the staff's recommendation concerning the annual incentive plan. For 2017. For 2017. Right. For managers and above. For managers and above. There you go. All right. Let's get it. second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. Now, that was staff, too. Manager and above. And, and staff. And staff. And staff. And staff. Yeah. Okay, okay, yes. and staff. And, and staff. staff. I, I didn't hear and staff. No, and staff. Okay, okay. And staff. all right. Definitely staff. Okay, all right. I didn't get who seconded the motion. Chuck. I'll help Dr. out. Whoever. Okay, all right. Mr. Petty. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. Uh, there being no further business, we are. Wait a second. What? what? I, we uh, didn't. We didn't do that one. I'll. I'll do that yeah. at the board. Just going to do annual. We'll do L tip uh, board. And, and then yeah. we'll do the other one at board. Okay. The full L tip goes to the board. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yes, okay. Yes, ma'am. I'll have three, four meetings before then, but I'll make it. You're lucky. If it's four. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then final AIP will be approved next week at board. That's what I'm saying. It'll, It'll be considered. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. The other thought could be that it could be so many fights at the ballot time on other seats that maybe they'll just vote for us and not say anything. Okay. Because it's going to be based we are on the, <laughs> based on the nations and all this, it's going to be some Thank you. Okay, all right, I'll get.